I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, the Pakani, and the Kainai First Nations, as well as the Tsitsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, the Bearspaw, and the Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, with gratitude. And now my screen's not advancing. There we go. Um, so just a reminder that uh, this is Nickel at Noon and we bring you something special every Thursday from 12 to 1, live, online. Um, the, all of these events, of course, are free, but you can um, get the passcodes through Eventbrite or by emailing Marla or myself. Full program is on our website and we would love for you to follow us on one of our social media accounts. Uh, I can add YouTube in there now because we have a YouTube station, a YouTube channel. We also have a mailing list. So if you would like event news delivered to your inbox, just connect with us and we'll make sure to add you. Um, just a few words about etiquette. We'd appreciate if you keep your microphones on mute for the duration of the, of the talk. Um, we'll hold questions until the end of the presentation, or if you have something burning, you can, you can use the chat and um, Marla or I will, will uh, relay that to Gwen. Um, also be aware that we're recording this and we'll add it to the, actually the Nichols YouTube channel with links on our website uh, so that you can watch it again or you can share it with your friends. Um, we will uh, uh, make sure that your names and the chat are not included in the recording, but be aware that if you speak up at any time, your voice will end up in the recording. So, um, oops, wrong names on this. On, on this. Uh, I'm not Marina Fisher, I'm Michelle Hardy, and I'm one of the curators with, uh, with Nickel Galleries and your host today. Um, behind the scenes is Marla Halstad, our front-end manager and co-host here. Next week, we'll be welcoming back Dick Averns. Uh, if you tuned in a few weeks ago, you'll remember that Dick was supposed to speak and we had terrible issues with technology. Those are all sorted out and Dick will be back to talk next week, so please join in. And I'm very pleased to welcome today Gwen McGregor, who is uh, our guest speaker, speaking about her project, Earthlings. Gwen is an artist working in installation, video, photography, and drawing. Her work is in a number of collections, including the Art Gallery of Ontario, Oakville Galleries, the Art Bank, and the Royal Bank Collection. She has, has an honors BA from U, the, sorry, York University, a master's in cultural geography from the University of Toronto, She's currently pursuing a PhD in geography, and she's originally from Calgary, though based in Toronto. So uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to welcome you, Gwen, and um, thank you for, uh, for joining us here today. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm going to start with an acknowledgement as well, uh, because I am not in Calgary. I'm in Toronto, so I'm on the, uh, today on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. And uh, this region of Canada is also part of the Dish with One Spoon wampum, which is a really important uh, understanding of the way to be together on the land and share the resources together. Um, and saying a, a, a land acknowledgement for me, it's really important not only to be acknowledging the history of the land and traditional territories, but for me, it's also about my ongoing commitment to change, um, to retribution for the Indigenous peoples, for them getting their land back, for um, getting sovereignty over their lives, their their laws, their, their families, everything like that. So, um, uh, the, it's an important part of who I am and uh, everything I do, whether I'm teaching, whether I'm uh, making art, if I'm uh, doing something related to geography. So it's all, all part of it for me. Okay, so I'm going to use a keynote today. So let me get that up. And uh, let, I guess I have to share the screen first. Hold on a second. Okay. 
And now I'll get the keynote going. So you should see, are you seeing the first slide with my name and earthlings? No, we're seeing an island or something. Oh. No, we see earthlings. Oh, there it is now. You're seeing it now. Okay, great. Just a little bit of a lag there. Okay, so th thanks very much for this opportunity. It's, it's um, a fairly short talk, so I thought, I've been an artist for a long time, so I thought what I would do is pick a selection of artworks from over the years that relate to two themes and threads that's, that continue to come back in my work. One of them is land, the representation of land, and our relationship to land. And the second is community and the building of community through uh, art practice. I have a really diverse art practice. Um, just wanna make sure that's running, okay. Uh, but I thought I do video, I do installation, drawing, um, photography, all different, all different kinds of art forms. But I, I wanted to start with this one, uh, which is probably the piece that has been shown the most around the world, really. Um, because I think it's a good way to sort of ground, as it were, my art, my art practice and some of the things that I'm interested in in the way I work. Uh, this piece was done in a residency in France, which is residencies have also been really important for my art practice in terms of the way I make work and think about the work. Um, it's uh, about two hours outside of Paris in a small village, and this is a real place. Um, I went to the same place every day for two months, took a photograph, and then the only thing I did to them is I reversed them, and I was there in the spring. So when I was there, the trees were blooming, uh, all coming out, uh, and I took all that and reversed it. So what it ended up doing is revealing the, the those are uh, cooling towers for a nuclear power station in the background. I didn't know that that was there when I uh, arrived, until I arrived. I was quite horrified, to be honest. Um, they have a very different relationship with their, their power stations in France. They're very proud of them. They don't hide them behind green hills the way we do in Canada. Uh, you can get quite close. They light them up. They, it's part of the, like, in the tourist brochure, they talk about it. Uh, so I couldn't ignore it, um, but was very aware of it and so decided to just go with it as, as my muse for the time I was there. And so this is one of the pieces uh, that I made. But I, I really explored it in many different ways and I actually started to think of it almost like I think of the mountains, uh, which was very strange, um, in that I would kind of check them every day, how the light was falling on them. They're quite beautiful forms. I would see which way the wind was blowing from the plume of it. Uh, I got sort of really kind of a, almost obsessed with these, these power, power stations. So then at the end, I felt I really needed to kind of purge the whole thing. So I, um, and I was in residence with uh, six other people. So I made a cake uh, of the power station and uh, we ate the cake and we washed it down with champagne. And that just seemed like a perfect way to purge it from my system and do it in a very French way. Interestingly, and kind of strangely, in 2017, the power station had a 30, 30th anniversary exhibition, and they asked me to put that piece in, and I did. Um, but I really wondered if they watched it, because it's pretty critical of the uh, nuclear power industry. Um, but I just kind of love the fact that it was there playing within the station itself. That just seemed kind of perfect for that piece. So I'm going to go back further. Um, process has always been part of my art practice. And like I said, the land representations of land have, have been important. And starting in the 90s with my partner there, Lewis, uh, when we lived in London, we had this um, project where we uh, went mudlarking, which basically means digging up the mud uh, in the River Thames of London and, and picking up stuff that's um, been buried there. Uh, there are professional mudlarkers. They, what they do is they're looking for stuff that they can sell to the British Museum or to antique dealers. What we were doing is just, just because we wanted to do it and the, the amazing amount of stuff that came out of that river. So over a number of years, I did a, a number of installations that used some of the objects that we found. And one of the first one was using clay pipes. 
um, and was shown the first time in 1993 here in Toronto. So that you're looking at the ends of either the stem or the bowl of the clay pipes. The technology for tobacco came from North America and through colonial contact and then was taken back to, to Europe and was turned into a commodity. So it lost its specificity and its cultural references uh, that it had had here in, in North America. So I like the idea of, uh, and, and clay pipes were used for smoking uh, um, until cigarettes were invented and they were sort of semi-disposable uh, and were thrown away, but they hang around. So we gathered over 4,000 of them, uh, shipped them back to Canada. And I like this idea of it being this kind of uh, returning loop. And definitely they look like bones and it's referencing the, the decimation of indigenous uh, cultures and uh, peoples here in North America. It got shown again in 2006 in a completely different context, but was really great. It was this series that Janet Bellotto did where artists got a uh, tool shed uh, somewhere in Toronto and mine was placed right outside Fort York, which was really great because Fort York at the time, especially nothing, there was nothing in any of the displays or presentations within Fort York that referenced indigenous peoples. It was like they, there weren't really any, there weren't any. And so it felt very appropriate to have that uh, right outside. It's a completely different uh, presentation. I like the idea of being able to just, you know, change it up to the specificity of the location. And so I took out the floor, put all the clay pipes in the floor and a sort of a slice out of the top so that the light could come in. And I spoke to the chief of the, of the Mississaugas of the Credit at the time to find out where their land claim was because I knew they were still uh, fighting over the, the land claim that had right from the very beginning had been a problem. And uh, I found out that it still had not been settled in 2006. So on the doors of the shed, I put some of the, the documents uh, that in terms of their uh, claim. Uh, the claim was finally settled in 2010. It, it first started in late 1700s. This is a, another one of the pieces that I did uh, with objects from the Mudlarking. Uh, these are pins, uh, clothing pins, straight pins that are made by hand. Uh, and so I photographed them all. I blew them up twice the size so you could see what they look like and put them in these rows because they were handmade. And the history and knowledge of the people who made these is, is very, um, it's kind of sketchy because they were very considered very lower class in the in the UK. And so I wanted to show the labor and sort of honor the, the individuality of them. And then this is what they actually look like. So that tiny little pile of pins uh, looks very different when they're each taken out and kind of blown up. I mentioned that residencies are have been really important and one I did quite a few years ago was at the Southern Alberta Gallery. Um, that, that, that newspaper article on the right, um, Joan Stebbins came to my studio and she asked me about that picture because it was up in my studio. And I explained that the man on the left uh, was my grandfather, uh, James White, and um, he was part with the with uh, elders from um, the uh, Tanaha band was part of this um, curse lifting ceremony in 1963. And I, I had wanted to sort of explore it, but had never done anything about it. So she invited me to do a residency and I managed to discover that my grandmother actually had some super eight films of the ceremony. And that's a still from the film on the left. So I went and found two family members of the Gravel family who were part of the Tanaha band who were at the ceremony and then two members of my family and I interviewed them all and I asked them the same questions just about what the curse was, uh, if they thought it really was, had been lifted, did it really exist and it took me on this incredible journey because I found out of course that the, uh, the, there were many stories that I didn't know, many points of view and that the story that I knew was only the white settler part of it and there was a whole other history uh, and connection to uh, Tanaha stories which, which I hadn't known. Um, that piece recently was shown again. Um, oh and I just should say that that photograph on the left I connected up with Kim Gravel who was the great 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 granddaughter of one of the two uh, elders in, it's in this photograph and she was living at Lethbridge at the time and um, she showed me these pictures in her baby book and when she showed me this one and I said oh that's my that's my grandfather in the sitting there in the front and she said um, 
oh, wow, I just wondered who that white dude was in the photograph. Um, so it, there were some great connections made um, with this, this piece. It was uh, recently shown at the Fernie Museum in 2015. Um, just a little story. I couldn't remember exactly when this piece was first shown at the Southern Alberta Gallery. So I actually went uh, and looked it up and it's not on their website. Um, that whole year for some reason is missing. I mean, I, I have got in touch with them to ask them about it. Um, they're just a, sort of a blank for that year. Um, but it made me realize that uh, this, I need to get on this and this this piece the full video is not on my website but i i need to get it digitized it's still on like beta cam or something i need to get it digitized and on my website because i think the voices two out of the four people who were interviewed uh for it um have passed on and passed away and uh, i think it's important to get their voices out kind of there and accessible to people who want to know about the story one another residency I did was in uh, New York with the ISCP and through the Canada Council uh, studio, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. The Canada Council doesn't support artists in this way, which they, they fund artists in a, in a residency sort of independently or individually. But I, I think it's a shame that these these studios don't exist anymore. It was a, a really amazing opportunity uh, to have a studio and an apartment for six months in New York. Uh, when I went, I was reading a lot of Paul Auster, and this is a page from one of his novels, New York Trilogies, um, and he talks a lot about marking the city through walking. And at the time, the GPS technology was just coming out, self, self iPhones didn't exist yet, so we, everyone didn't have them yet, but you could get them as independent units. And I started recording everywhere I went, I kept it with me all the time I was there. Uh, and then I kept doing it when I came back to Toronto. And in fact, I did it for a number of years. And so what you're seeing here is each day being drawn and then fading. And you can also see then this the, the accumulation. So the places that I went more often than not uh, become darker. And I had certain kind of rules. So for example, I wasn't allowed to go somewhere for fun just to make a drawing. So, I mean, that's something that a lot of people do now, which I think is kind of interesting where they intentionally like go on a run so they can make a drawing. Uh, I was working the other way around where it was really about the tracing of my, my daily routine, the things that I would just uh, normally do. I did a series with the GPS. I don't do them. I don't do it anymore. I don't carry it around anymore. Um, I, I felt like I'd kind of done what I could do with it. Uh, but this is one of two that I did uh, around Fernie. I have uh, this connection to Fernie through my grandfather and my family has a cottage uh, on Rosen Lake, which I go to every year and have been my whole life. So I have a pretty deep connection with that area. Uh, this is one uh, we call it the Three Sisters Mountain, but it's not the real Three Sisters. It's actually Trinity Mountain. And I have a GPS and that's me in the blue line. And then I have a companion with me who uh, is the kind of gold line. And it shows us as we make our way kind of up the mountain. Um, and what you see here in a moment is it kind of explains why the one is going very differently than the other is my companion was a dog, Seamus. Uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful guide dog. And uh, uh, I did two pieces with him over two years on two different mountains. Uh, I put this one in also because I don't know if, if Dan actually uh, is here today, but this is, there are two canoes and Dan and his partner Enza is in the light blue canoe and I'm, and my partner are in the dark blue canoe. And, and my partner and I had never done white water uh, canoeing before so we were desperately just trying to keep up and follow what they were doing um, and this is just an excerpt so this is uh, video is the entire it was like a four-day trip and it follows us uh, through the river and our attempts to try and um, <laughs> keep afloat <laughs> and keep up Uh, as mentioned at the beginning, I went back to school and decided to do a master's in cultural geography. And this was a work that I did while I was uh, beginning to do that. And it was, um, I was thinking a little bit differently about my work 
and experimenting in different ways about how to bring different kinds of information together. This is part of a, a series that KWAG did called the River Grand Chronicles. So it was work that related to the Grand River. And for me, what I had to do, the starting place had to be the river itself. And so um, with a very good friend of mine, who's a good canoeist, Gord Hicks, we um, canoed down the Grand River, it took us about seven days. And it was a very good thing he, he was there because on the first day there was one unmarked weir. Um, we had to portage it, but I've never had to portage a canoe up and down stairs in a canyon before. <laughs> so I, I was uh, super glad that he, he, was, uh, he was with me. Um, at the end, we, the, it ended up uh, at Lake Erie and, and fortunately kind of timed it so that it, um, as the sun was going down in Lake Erie, so then what I did in the gallery is there were three parts. This is the, the video part, and it's basically just the beginning and the end of the journey uh, where, we, where we put in the canoe and then uh, Lake Erie at the end. And then the second part, the piece on the floor is a, is a map, and it's using uh, data sets from GIS of wildflowers, 125 different kinds of wildflowers that grow in the region. And I collected recycled packaging from people in the neighborhood around the gallery and I color coded it so that each, uh, it all either had said either natural or organic on the packaging and that each flower had a designated piece of packaging so that you could kind of code. Uh, and on one side you saw the packaging and then on the other side you saw the, the drawing of the uh, flower which I, I drew in a very kind of traditional uh, black and white illustrative kind of style. Um, and so they were placed within this, this mapping of the watershed of where, of where they would uh, theoretically grow. And then the third part is uh, an animation on the wall. Um, and I'll, I'll switch to this one. Um, and this did, uh, we, uh, ha I had a GPS in the boat uh, to record where we went. And so the blue line is the GPS of us going down the river. And then the, the other part, that red, um, it's kind of rectangular shape um, is the Haldeman Tract, which, which anyone in the region would know was a land that the six, na six nations were supposed to get and were promised by the, the British government, but didn't get. And so it's very intentionally being uh, provocative um, that, you know, as sort of two white people are canoeing down the river, the Haldeman tract and the watershed kind of disappears. I had done this on purpose and really hoped it would provoke conversation. Uh, but what I discovered, this is a good learning experience because the audience uh, at the time for KWEG was mostly, was not indigenous. The d indigenous community don't come to the gallery so much. Um, and everyone just kind of ignored it uh, and never didn't ask me about it at all, <laughs> which I found really interesting. And, um, and made me think about different kinds of strategies for the future. There is a catalog for this show uh, that is available online and there's a really great uh, um, essay in it by R uh, Richard William Hill, who did a very good job of explaining the context, um, the historical context and the Haldeman Tract, which is uh, really, and also uh, being very honest about the difficult relationship. Uh, which was a great companion uh, to the show. Uh, I like working collaboratively and one of the collaborations I've had is with my partner, Lewis, who, I, who you saw in that photograph from the beginning. Um, we've also done work together and this was a residency we did together at, at, in Dawson, Yukon. Uh, we were there for June and then we went back in December and we recorded the Second Avenue um, so we're looking at the longest day and the longest night. It's a time lapse. And so this one really brings together both the representations of community and the land and this very specific and quite extreme environment um, and how different it is from the summer, this glorious 24 hour daylight in the summer and then almost no daylight and sort of minus, uh, what was it? Minus 50, I think um, in the winter, um, yeah. This is a series I did on another residency uh, when I was away in India and uh, was in the south of India for two months in Fort Kochi and then in the north of India in Varanasi. And I became very aware of my implication in, gar in relationship to garbage because there's a real problem with garbage in India. There just really isn't anywhere to put it. 
but much of the garbage that's the, the biggest problem is the plastic stuff that tourists bring and water bottles and stuff like that that doesn't break down. And so I was thinking through ideas around that and the connection between sort of tourism, my implications and, and being there in India. And so I did a series of these collages and they're both sort of in real space and in digital space. And in some cases actually taking pictures like standing in the garbage and taking the pictures or even then taking, taking pictures and putting it in the garbage and then re-photographing it. So, oh, uh, Just lost everyone. I can see you, Gwen. Hi. Oh, did it just the, did the, the, um, the the island? Oh, there. Is it back? Yeah, it's back. Okay, cool. I don't know why I did that. All right. So, um, okay. So the garbage. Yes. So this was a place that we stayed in one of the residencies, but in the kind of juxtapositions, this was right outside the front door of the wall, uh, which is a very kind of typical um, scenario and uh, in India. So th this, these works needed a, a really good place to show and it took a while, it took a few years for the, for the right um, context, but it was kind of perfect. It was the very, it was a show that was done at Honest Ed's in 2017 called Toronto for Everyone before Honest Ed's was torn down. And so I put them on a uh, sticky back vinyl, stuck them right on the wall in this very funky uh, circumstance of, of Honest Ed. So it could really could speak to ideas around consumerism, to development uh, and kind of the connection between money and development because uh, there's a huge condo building that's now uh, going up in that area. Um, so I was very happy with that uh, possibility. I did another piece uh, from that same resident time in Indian residency where I kept all the non-perishable garbage from one location, sorted it, and then mailed it back of about using this, you know, the slow boat uh, back to myself. Um, there is a thing in India where if you are mailing packages internationally, you have to go get them sewn at a tailor before you can take them to the, the um, post office. And this is a uh, leftover from the British Raj. It's this sort of hangover from that era, which I found really interesting is a, a good friend of mine, uh, Sarinda Dhaliwal, who told me that before I went and she's just sort of, she's just sort of in, in a very Sarinda way, she just kind of said, you know, Gwen, you might be interested to know that they do this with the mail. Because she knew I would take it. And I was like, oh, take it, take it and do something interesting with it. Um, so this is shown at, they all came back. Uh, they weren't opened. Um, and I showed the piece at MKG, which is my commercial gallery in Toronto. And it's sitting on uh, a piece of furniture that I then ordered from Amazon uh, and it came in two days. And I should mention that the packages, I think, took three months. So there's all kinds of uh, uh, juxtapositions. But if you open the drawer, there was a piece of paper that actually told you what was in. There was an inventory of what was in the packages. So there is, there's a real juxtaposition here between um, understanding of, of uh, kind of privilege, colonialism, speed, time, space, all kinds of stuff kind of floating around in this, in this work. This is a video that I did for the anniversary of MKG127. Uh, um, he was uh, very good natured. I hope that that isn't too loud, but uh, he was very good natured about this video uh, because I wasn't making reference to the gallery when, with this video in terms of the, the uh, crumbling house. Um, I'm really thinking more just about land again. And so what you're seeing here is a house that's just north of Toronto and uh, I videoed it 10 years apart and that, that's what it looks like. This is a piece that, uh, a collaborative piece uh, uh, that I was invited to participate in that Gillian Waring, who's quite a well-known British artist, uh, did, where she invited people to do a video where they open their window or the blind and show what's outside their window. Um, and this is me, it's unfortunately she got the name wrong. It's not Cloys Bay, it's Cold Boys Bay. Uh, but this was my contribution to the piece. It was a much, much longer piece where she got people all around the world uh, to do this great thing. And it's kind of amazing one to see now during COVID when we're all kind of inside and looking at our windows. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more now on not only about land and representation of land, but also about this idea of community and building community through art making, because that's the other major thread in my work that just keeps coming back. 
Um, I was invited to participate in Nuit Blanche in 2013 by Ami Barak, but I really, um, having spoken to quite a few artists who had already shown in Nuit Blanche, I was a little bit worried about the amount of uh, labor involved to create a piece that is large enough and substantial enough to have the kind of impact. So I approached uh, the, the Work Party Art Collective, who I am part of, have been part of, and we've done other pieces together before, if they were interested in doing something together, and they were, and so we came up with this piece together. Uh, Work Party is a, a group uh, where cross generations, uh, designers, artists, and some were students who then became friends and uh, worked together with them. And so what you're seeing here is a protest of kinder toys going into City Hall in the front lobby. And uh, to put it in context, you have to remember that Ford was our mayor at the time. And so the not good enough uh, was about as direct as we could get away with. I was actually even amazed they let us uh, say that at all. And apparently normally um, protests aren't allowed in, in uh, City Hall and we had to get special permission. Um, and placards aren't allowed. So we had to get special permission for the little placards. Um, and this just shows us installing it and working through uh, putting everything together. And there's actually a narrative within the Kinder Toys. There's a kind of uh, environmental, it's kind of an environmental disaster that happens over time use it through sort of Kinder Toy narrative, I guess you could put it. Uh, we didn't have to stay, but we, most of us just stayed most of the night. It was so fascinating to watch. It was, I forget how many, how many they estimated. Uh, there was over a million people that went to Nuit Blanche that year. We, they said something like they think 500,000 or something saw the piece, uh, which was fascinating. But one of the things we noticed, which was a bit alarming, is that we felt that the, the, the kind of nostalgia of the kinder toys over, um, took over and the message was kind of lost, we felt. And we think also maybe just because of, of it being Nuit Blanche and the way people kind of consume the work over that night, it was just a kind of a bit, um, yeah, it was just the way they were uh, taking it in and taking it in on their, on their cell phones and selfies and stuff. So it was, it was loved, but it was also, we felt it kind of missed the point. Uh, so we had the opportunity to show it again in Regina for a series that they've done for a number of years called Pop-Up Downtown. We had to totally reconfigure it and that's a two of the collective members there on the left who were, who were putting it uh, together. Four of us went to install it and we had to completely change the arrangement because it was in a, a store window this time. But also we uh, connected up with a group of Indigenous activists who had been camping out at the Aboriginal Affairs Office for about 80 days when they were just down the road and uh, we offered them our signs, as it were, that they could, whatever they wanted to say and felt needed to be said could be put on the signs. They were very interested in working with us. They chose to stay anonymous. That was their decision uh, because they felt it was, they didn't want to be named because just in terms of uh, their own personal safety. But also what you're seeing there are their um, concerns and uh, their actions that they would like to see happening. Um, and it really had an impact, I think, uh, in, in a way that, um, like I said, that it, it just didn't quite somehow in um, Louis Blanche. So we were very happy with the opportunity to be able to, to uh, redo that. And this was a, so this was a sort of multi-layered collaboration, not only with Work Party itself, but also then with um, issues and people uh, within Regina speaking through us. I have another ongoing collaboration with Sandra Rechico, which has been going since 2011 when we were invited to uh, do an exhibition. We were invited by Dan Adler to show, to collaborate for a show with Mercer Union because Sandra has her own uh, map related art practice. Um, and we've shown in, in a, a number of different places, but this one particular, like, I, I can't talk about all the projects uh, today, but you can certainly kind of look it up. But what came out of this uh, was this one particular project called Map It Out that continues to go. It first started in Berlin when we were showing there and in this really unusual uh, gallery that was really, um, it was part, part of the Hackerscherhof, which is right in the downtown part of Berlin and inside a shopping area. 
and, and mostly glass. Uh, so we decided to incorporate, for, for another piece we were doing, we wanted to gather data from people about um, distance and time that we turned into an installation. But we thought just while we were there, why not ask them also to draw a map about um, how you got here today? We had no intention of uh, including that in the solo exhibition, but it completely took off and people stayed and they drew. And so since then, and let's just go back, we've, we've shown it, um, done the map mapping out thing. We've done it in Long Island. We've been in Cardiff. Um, and more, most recently, last fall, we were at asked to participate in this uh, cartography, radical cartography conference um, in Providence, Rhode Island at Brown University. Uh, so we were really honored to be part of this because there were some really impressive scholars there doing important and difficult work about things like investigating the massacre in Tulsa and the decimation of the African-American community in that city that, that has uh, only really uh, coming to light uh, now. Um, and so we uh, had an exhibition that related to this and we did, we participated in the conference and we did the mapping out activity and they arranged for us to do it in six different places within Providence, which was amazing. So on the left there, we, we actually met up with the city planners one day um, and lured them in with, with donuts and they uh, participated, but we also went to a heritage festival. We went to a Latinx uh, sort of weekend outdoor festival. Um, and then everything was brought together in, in the gallery. And what you're seeing here on the right are the maps that people drew in Providence. And then on the tables are a selection of the maps from other locations. And um, the, the maps are really amazing. Uh, they are often when people think um, they can't draw or they say, I can't draw, I, or I, I don't know how to do a map. And then they do the most amazing things uh, that are very personal and specific to where they are and who they are. Um, so, and it's an ongoing project. We're, we're hopefully be able to keep, keep doing this. Um, and one day it'll be a book or a website or something. Um, haven't got there yet. So uh, this is an, a fairly recent exhibition that I had in a public gallery at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery, which is in Oshawa. And it related to a bigger project where that was about Alexandra Luke, who was one of the artists of the Painters 11. And I was invited to, so there was, uh, they have uh, a number of her works in the collection. So the idea was to show her work and then uh, invite a couple of artists to do something that related to her. Uh, so I was interested more in thinking about her and her life as an artist than specifically her artwork uh, as a painter. And so I did two projects. This was one of them called Message Threads. And I found out that the, there's a house very near the gallery that used to be owned by the McLaughlins that is now a YWCA for women and children uh, who are um, you know, needing to get out of a dangerous situation. So um, I, took quotes from Alexandra Luke's diary, some of them quite mundane, some of them quite aspirational. And, uh, and through the gallery, they asked if any of the women were interested in participating and some of them were. I gave them the list of quotes, they picked one, and then I offered to embroider it on a piece of their clothing and then give it back to them. And they had the, they had the choice if they would let me take a portrait that was that would be great but i didn't they didn't want to because of the situation they're in i also understood that that privacy could be an issue so these are uh this shows some of the work that i did um and the the garments that they chose and it was actually quite moving because some of them chose really personal things um like the never stand still vest she wears that all the time and so i felt quite honored that she would let me take it and Put something on it and, and give it back. Um, I also took, there's also a, there was a store in the basement f to buy clothes quite cheaply, kind of a Sally Ann store, and they let me take some of the garments from there and embroider them and then just put them back in the store. And so, and I don't know whether people took them or not, I just, I just let them just kind of go. So this is an example of one of the women who did let me uh, take her portrait. The other piece I did 
related to this very famous set. There's a set of photographs you can see in the back here, the black and white. And Alexandra Luke is there on the left, sort of sitting on a white box. It's these really famous paintings of the Painters 11, looking very kind of mod and 50s and sort of, um, you know, of the time. And so I took one of those photographs, blew it up almost life size, and then invited women and non-binary artists to come and stand in front of the photograph and cover up the men. Uh, and, but that was the only instruction I gave them. And I shot video of the whole thing. Um, and at first I thought I was going to shoot a bunch of these and then edit them. But I just found that we did it four times and every time they did it, um, they got more relaxed, they got more animated, uh, they really started to get playful. And so I ended up just showing all of them uh, one after the other. And then the other thing I did, uh, so there are two videos that were shown together. And then the one on the right is uh, all the artists at the end uh, coming together for a portrait. And so I uh, hadn't originally intended to do that, but it was just so great uh, in terms of the way everyone's interacting that I really wanted to include it. And I have to say with this piece, it, I mean, I, I was very happy with the work and I was very happy with the way it worked in the gallery, but the day itself for me was the piece and the success, the, the time that everyone spent together for the day. That was where I felt uh, really the work exists there as much as the, the final result. Uh, I couldn't pay anyone. This was a, a project that had sort of uh, little or no funding. Um, so I was able to give the students a slight honorarium and then all the professional artists very kindly gave me their time. So what I did do is make sure that um, they just had a really lovely day. And so we, um, I made sure there was lots of great food and everyone was kind of hanging around and getting to know each other. And I think the age range of the artists was something like between 18 years old and maybe 70 all artists living in Toronto, but many who never met each other before. So that was, that was a really, uh, it was an amazing day and amazing um, experience. The project that I'm working on right now is called uh, Tree Lines. And this is its first iteration two years ago, so two, two year and a half ago, I guess now, um, in Athens. And what you're looking at are, uh, it's, it's a series of photographs and crochet trees. So the, the photograph there on the right, that big tree that's sort of on the left of the photograph, that's a crocheted tree that I've just stuck in front of the camera lens. Um, so this is on Hydra, one of the islands, and there's a little, tr that little tiny tree is in the middle of the, the temperate uh, forest there. And in this one, the little trees in the front are crocheted. So this project is happening on a bunch of different locations and it's functioning in a bunch of, in a, in a different, a number of different ways. I'm, I've certainly gone back to, I knew how to crochet. My mom taught me how to crochet when I was little. And through that other project where I was embroidering, I realized that I'd had all this knowledge and experience as a kid and, it, and, and loved it. And my mom was always making something. She continues to, to make and to paint. But I think I had it sort of beat out of me um, in art school, definitely when I was at York, that, that anything that was craft related was not art. And so I stopped doing it for a long, long time. And it's been fairly recently where I've just kind of finally realized that I had it in me. It's like in my fingers, I just picked it up and I started doing it. And it's a really great way to make sculpture is through, through crocheting. It's also an amazing way to connect with other people in community in this way that is really um, easy and low sort of stress. Um, and then the works, basically the idea is I go to places that have a history of logging, which now is unfortunately most of the planet, but I crochet trees specific to the region and I put them back there. And they're meant to be whimsical or a little bit sad, a little bit funny. They, they are kind of stand-ins for me. Um, they're meant to be awkward. Um, and then I've also, one of the things that I learned when I was there is uh, one of the craftspeople um, taught me how to take a plastic bag and how to cut it so it turns into one long strip and you can crochet with it. So I started crocheting plastic trees as well. And they are very intentionally made, they, you know, they have this kind of alien toxic look to them. 
or, or I also like the one on the left, I think of them as kind of ghost trees. So I've been doing that as well. And this is just uh, what it looked like in the, in the gallery in Athens. And the person who taught me how to do that is Click. This is Click, uh, amazing, amazing woman. She's, she's a beekeeper, she's a dancer, she's a crochet artist. Uh, she does many, many things in Athens. And that's her tree on right kind of beside her hand on the top left shelf that she contributed to the exhibition. And we were supposed to have a, a collaborative exhibition in Athens this summer where we were continuing to do a whole series of trees with root systems. Uh, both plastic and wool, but that got cancelled or maybe postponed. I don't quite know. So that's a little bit on hold for now, but um, we'll just have to wait and see what happens with that part of the project. I've done it in a number of different locations. This is the Outer Hebrides. Um, and I really wanted to go there because this, I've never been to the Highlands of Scotland, even though I've spent many, 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 many days, days, <laughs> hours in the mountains. Um, never in Scotland and that's where my peeps are from so it really felt like I should go there and uh, I certainly felt connected to it to the place and it was very appropriate for this project because the Outer Hebrides were, were logged uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago and uh, kind of a contentious issue there because they have completely adapted to sheep herding and so the idea of putting the trees back actually doesn't go over very well, depending on who you talk to there. So it's, it's complicated in a different way that I find kind of interesting. Uh, this just gives you a bit of the scale and that, that's a remnant of a picked village, which was from about, uh, I think, uh, 100 AD. Uh, and it was really amazing just to be on that land and, um, you know, being somewhere where, um, you know, my DNA has come from was, was, was interesting. I'm also working on it in the interior, and this is a, a hike that's kind of above Island Lake Lodge, uh, if anyone knows, just outside of Fernie. And this has a complicated connection for me in that my grandfather, who I said who, who was from there, and the one who was in that photograph um, earlier in the talk, he had uh, timber rights and uh, lumber yards. And so he was very involved in uh, logging, uh, which is uh, you know, a difficult history to be part of. At the same time, he donated some of his timber rights and land back to the local, uh, to the town because he didn't like the way the industry was going. So in this spot right here, to the, it's the only part of the valley um, that, is, has not been logged and is old growth and it is extraordinary. And so if you look past the crochet tree on the left, that's what you're seeing down in the valley and you kind of hike up to the spot. But then on the right, you see the hydro line and then further in the back, you can see clear cutting in, in the uh, next valley. So kind of lots of layers uh, complicating this one. This is actually one of the uh, lumber yards that he owned, it's Galloway Mill. and. Uh, I managed to, I was, it looks so deserted, but I was only there five minutes um, when the uh, security dudes showed up and um, really not, not very pleasant, uh, wanted me off the property pretty quick. I think maybe they thought I was a environmental activist or something. I think that's because I certainly was not a threat in any other way. Anyway, I managed to uh, get a few photographs of the tree uh, in the parking lot before I got um, taken away, not taken away, but told to get off, get off the property. Um, this is just a view of some of the trees uh, as they're in my studio and I'm still in the process of changing them. Those are rowan trees on the right and even those have changed as I continue to make them um, and figuring out the difference between deciduous and, and pine trees and just different kinds of trees. Anyway, it's part of, part of the process that I'm in right now. Um, and so one of the things that's happened because I was supposed to go to Scotland, I was supposed to go back to Greece, uh, this, I was supposed to go out west uh, this summer and none of that happened because of COVID. And so as we all have done, I, I, I've had to pivot and, and uh, think differently. And uh, so MKG had a show in the summer that was about COVID. So I decided I needed to know how to make a COVID. So um, I'm doing this project, ongoing project right now called the Interloper where I, I'm crocheting COVIDs and putting them in different environments and photographing them. And again, it's meant to be, I hope it's not in bad taste. It's meant to be uh, making a bit light of it, but also kind of ominous uh, because it is a kind of, it's a stuffy toy, but a rather toxic, uh, you know, representation of something very toxic. And I'm placing it in different environments. Um, 
And the one on the left there, if you know your <laughs> plants in Ontario, there's a bit of a joke there. Uh, those lovely great big green leaves in the front are poison ivy. And um, I am really allergic to poison ivy. Um, I, I didn't get it on me. I'm very careful now. I know how to do it, but it's, that's what's happening there. And then the one um, on the right at the bottom, that's the Toronto airport. And I'm certainly, I'm considering also pivoting the tree project to Toronto and I'm just trying to figure out how to learn how to crochet black walnut because there would have been black walnut and the Toronto Island was part of the this kind of circles back it's part of the um, treaty that that uh, the Mississaugas never uh, gave up the island um, it was just taken and so um, there's a, a whole other narrative that can happen if I'm working with uh, black walnut and images of the Toronto Island that I'm going to pursue and just to, to close up, uh, just to let you know that in sort of my part of my other life, uh, this article has just come out that I've been working on for quite a while that's about the work of Bonnie Devine and Nicole Clouston in relationship to Lake Ontario. Um, and I'm very happy to be supporting and talking about a couple of artists' work who I think uh, just aren't getting enough um, exposure. And I just thought I would leave it here um, I've turned the sound way down, but just thought you might like to see that one of my little trees uh, just uh, being battered by the fierce um, Hebrides uh, wind, but that's, this is also part of this project. There, there will be some uh, continue to be video uh, taken in different environments. Um, so that's it. Um, I'll wrap it up there. Uh, thank you very much. And also I'll unshare my screen and we can take it from there. Well, this was this was fantastic, Gwen. What a what a privilege to um, to learn about your work and and you know your images and the videos are so provocative and so interesting. We have um, just a couple of minutes, and um, you know I'd love to uh, I'd love to have some discussion or have some questions. If anybody has something they would like to ask, please unmute yourself or or um, add something into the um, into the chat um, and I maybe I'll jump in and start that I don't see anything popping up just yet but but Gwen I'm, I'm curious about the reception of your of your work um, within geography uh, uh, because you, you yeah. sort of um, bridge two different worlds and uh, um, yeah they yeah they um, the geographers really like my work and I have to say I was Pleasant. I wasn't sure how I'd be even received or accepted when I first went back to school, um, and I was really embraced. And I have, to, I have to. I remember one of the first classes, you know, where where you with your core group and you're going around and talking about yourself. And I was talking about what I did, and and uh, the professor said she was just like, oh, "There really has been a cultural turn in geography. We have an artist." It was like that, and I was just like, "Oh wow, okay." <laughs> um, but um, they they take it's interesting because they often take different things from it, which is, uh, I really, you know, they, they're, of course, they've got their geography brains on. So, and very often immediately they're thinking about the politics of the land. Um, so they go there first rather than, and then maybe not so much about, um, aesthetic considerations or how the work fits into, uh, conversations about contemporary art or history of contemporary art. You know, they can't really speak to that, but they certainly can, uh, relate to those other issues because, um, you know, geography is really all about place and space and uh, ideas around nation and borders and, and environmental issues and uh, climate change and all that. So they, they, uh, they understand it very well on that, on that level. Nice. Nice. Um, there's, there is a question here about how long you leave the crocheted trees. Oh, yeah. At the moment, I'm not leaving them there because um, there's, they take a long time to crochet. Um, mm -hmm. And so they are a little bit precious. However, I would love to leave them there. There's that part of it um, that I had been thinking about. And um, especially the, well, I don't know if I should say the plastic ones because it's sort of awful that I'm putting the plastic back in the environment. Um, but that is something that I have thought about is uh, leaving them there. and either seeing what happens to them or whether if someone else would take them, which um, might be quite sweet in terms of when I think of like the embroidery and doing the embroidery in the, on the clothing that was in the store and just like letting it go. Um, 
people really, when I originally started the project, I wasn't going to show the trees. I was just going to show the photographs, but the way people react to the trees is really visceral. And so um, I think because they have that um, there, it's like a, like a pet tree or like having a stuffed animal, only it's a tree. Um, so people are quite, um, you know, they really want to hold them and they, they get quite sort of, um, you know, I don't animate it when they're there. So that I've shifted that because of the, of the response from, from other people. So, um, but it's a good, a good question. That's certainly in my mind. If I, I just need to either get faster or I have to get more people approaching. <laughs> so I don't feel so, they don't feel so precious. They are, they are really beautiful objects. And can you say something about the, the scale? Oh, um, yeah, actually, don't mean to, here, hold on, I'll get one. Yeah, just hold this second, I'll bring one. One advantage of doing it this way, <laughs> you're in my studio. So, um, so they are, they tend to range, but this is a bigger one. This is the one that was in BC. This is a Douglas fir. Um, so it's meant to be, you know, they are huge trees. Um, I'm not doing it scientifically in terms of the scale. Uh, this is one of the, the, uh, the smaller, um, this is actually one of the ones in this one actually. Mm. So that's kind of how big. Um, They've gotten bigger and bigger, uh, and it's become a bit of a problem. And I think part of it is that um, they started quite small, and then as I got better at them and started becoming more detailed, it's like they had to be a certain size for there to be enough articulation. But um, I, I'm trying not to, I don't want them any bigger than this, um, really. And partially, uh, a practical reason is so that they can fit in a suitcase. Mm -hmm. So if I am going to go different places, um, although my partner, he just kind of says, well, just let them, why are you worrying about it? Just let them be as big as they need to be. But I, I'm, I don't know. I sort of am afraid they're going to end up being tree size, which is, I don't know, that seems wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so that's the kind of scale I'm kind of working at. Part, part of it too, is just the technical part of it is that they, I've had to learn how to put an armature in them, uh, because they soften because they're crocheted over time. They kind of droop. And so there's issues like that that I have to deal with, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's mm -hmm. the size. Well, it's such an interesting project. Um, it is 102. Are there any last thoughts or questions? Don't be shy. Not hearing anything. What's okay? When this was fabulous and I, I really enjoyed um, learning about you and, and the work and um, uh, hopefully we can continue this discussion. Hopefully we yes. can uh, meet face to face. <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. You know, let's let's be optimistic, um, and and really, uh, you know, really fun to watch those videos of you and Dan uh, whitewater rafting. Oh my God, that trip was be off the screen. <laughs> I was, anyway, I got hit by a tree. I got, there's a, a sweeper, anyway, got knocked out of the canoe. Um, he thought it was hysterical, of course. But anyway, it was a, it was an amazing trip. And by the end of the trip, um, we, we wanted to go back and do it again because we felt like we, we had, you know, by that point we sort of had the skills that we wanted to sort of do it again and, and do a better job of it. But um, it's a fantastic, fantastic trip. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And thank you. just remind everybody that next week is Dick Alburn's. Um, and I should get this video cleaned up and hopefully posted to YouTube. I will make sure that you have the link, Gwen. And once again, thank you so much. This was just fantastic. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.